joining us this morning on Financial Renaissance with the M's. I am your host, Emma Folks, and we have our very special guest host this morning, Jeffrey Wright. Good morning, Jeffrey. Good morning. How are you? We all right. We all right? All right. So Jeffrey's in town. We had our strategic planning meeting at our office yesterday. Uh, Jeffrey is the one of the managing directors of uh, Greenwood Wealth Management uh, with offices in Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama, and Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, we had our strategic planning meeting yesterday and talked a lot about why we got together as a company, um, kind of what led to that. And, you know, the topic that we have today, um, the show's going to be about reparations. And reparations is one of those lightning rod issues. It's like talking about cleaning up uh, Social Security. But we are going to jump into reparations today because it's a hot topic and that's what the presidential candidates are talking about. But before we jump into the topic, I do want to, I want to talk a little bit about our president. Um, not, not a fan, per se, but I am a fan of the fact that his presidency, his uh, candidacy, brought up a lot of stuff, a lot of bitter, bitter, bitter stuff that I feel is kind of the cancer of our country, and we're having conversations about it, if nothing else. Before... Um, Donald Trump was elected, you know, Je Jeffrey and I worked at the same firm for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And we used to have to sit in meetings, office meetings, and listen to people speak very negative, negatively about Obama. And, and, you know, like him, don't like him, whatever. He was still the president of the United States, but there was a lot of nasty stuff that was said about him. And we used to just have to sit by and listen to it. And when Donald Trump got elected, you know, we didn't think it was going to happen. And like literally we I was in shock and I know you were in shock the next day after Donald Trump was elected I got a phone call <laughs> I got a phone call from Jeffrey can you PG-13 yeah so I just decided it was time to stop paying people who did not support or even believe in us so I called Emma that morning and just said simply hey you want to do this like we've been talking about a firm for some time and I just said you know what let's go ahead and do it yeah we got our we we knew what we need to know about how the rest of every, well most of the country a good part of the country felt the con a lot of the conservatives and especially in our industry you know there are people that are managing money that don't care about you they don't care about your babies they don't care about your grandbabies they don't care about your legacy and what we wanted to do when we created Greenwood was have a company that actually cares about the community. So it doesn't matter, you know, if you're white, black, Indian, you know, Asian, Latino, or Latinx, you know, where you come from. But if you, if you are a hardworking individual, if you care about our country, um, if you, you care about the next generation, we want to make sure that we take care of you the way your family would take care of you. And we just didn't see that happening in a lot of places. We saw people kind of laughing about people that looked like Jeffrey and I and the trials and tribulations that we had. And, and there was just a total disregard for anything that led up to why there was such an imbalance in wealth. And it, it was just a very hard pill for us to swallow day in and day out and day in and day out. And finally, we had had enough. He took off before I did, and then I, I was trying to complete my CFP before I took off. But it felt good turning in my resignation. I know you felt good, and oh, your your dude know, knew it was coming anyway. But it was glorious. It was glorious. But yeah, the day that we decided that we're going to do this together, um, there were people who weren't particularly happy. Even people that looked like us that weren't particularly happy. And um, but we didn't care. We knew what we wanted to build. Um, and we've been building it brick by brick by brick by brick and it hasn't been easy but it has been fun it has been exhilarating and unlike a lot of people we actually have our families our wives that that have been backing us up so you know if you're you can go online our website is being designed right now but greenwoodwm.com we are on sensation station network live on Facebook we will see you after the break Listen, as a hiring manager, I've got to tell you, the best job candidate isn't always the typical candidate. Sometimes they're a grad of life. 
Meet the grads of life. Young adults of unique determination and experience. An ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. Sometimes the best candidates aren't the ones you're used to. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. To buy your home, you became a house hunting ace. Learned about loans, scoured neighborhoods, and asked the right questions. Now you're queen of your castle. If you manage that, you can get your retirement plan on track. Visiting aceyourretirement.org can help. With 401k tips and smart saving strategies, you will feel empowered to own your retirement like you own your home. Go to aceyourretirement.org. Because when it comes to clearing financial hurdles, you're an ace. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Honey, what you cook for dinner tonight? Do you want the good news or the bad news first? The bad news first. I cooked nothing. Well, that's the good news then. Uh-huh. Well, there's no bad news then because tonight we're going to have your palace. Jack Palace for authentic Caribbean cuisine, including vegetarian entrees with authentic Caribbean flavor. Call 770-892-5049, located at 6221 Jonesboro Road, Highway 54 in Morrow, Georgia. Jack Palace. Whoa, long time no see. It's me, the rock t-shirt in the back of your closet. Dude, remember? You crowd surfed in me, man. But you haven't worn me in like forever. I get it, you're retired, but I still got some rock left in me. So take me to Goodwill, where I can really make a difference. Your donations to Goodwill create jobs, training programs, and education assistance for people in your community. To find your nearest donation center, go to Goodwill.org. Donate stuff. Create jobs. A message from Goodwill and the Ad Council. Indoor baseball, anyone? <laughs> Most party fouls are pretty dumb, but if you decide to drink and drive underage, you could lose your license and your freedom. Learn more at ultimatepartyfoul.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. If you have the questions, we have the answers. Go to SSNATL.com and click on the contact tab. As much as you like. We're the nation's urban station online. SSNATL.com. You are listening to Financial Renaissance with the M's, and we have an exciting show today. Uh, we are going to be diving into reparations. We're going to talk about what the Bible says about slavery and paying us back our shekels. <laughs> shekels. <laughs> Run me my shekels, man. I that... my shekels. Right. And then we're going to talk about other examples uh, throughout history of, of countries that had to pay back reparations, what it looked like, and um actually what happened with it um if what we'd like you to do though is we are streaming on facebook live at sensation station network in the comment section go ahead and give us your civil opinions on reparations if you want to join the conversation by sending us a text message you can text us at 678-613-5857 so let's talk about reparations what does reparations mean Reparations, the making amends for a wrong one, for a wrong one, that, for the wrong that a person has done by paying money or otherwise helping those who have been wronged. So in relations to slavery, um, the wrong was uh, people were kidnapped from Africa, they were brought over to the Americas, and they were forced into slave labor for multiple generations, which as we've found out, goes against the Bible, what the Bible actually says. Um, we were looking up in, uh, in Leviticus. Was it Leviticus 25? 20, Leviticus 25, 8. Leviticus 25, 8, the year of Jubilee. Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all of its inhabitants. Translation. Every 50 years, if you were in bondage or if you sold property to pay a debt, it went back to the original owners. So your children were not in bondage in perpetuity. You were not perpetually um, discriminated against and also left left out of wealth building opportunities. You got your land or, you know, assets back. 
yeah, with the within the Bible, it says, you know, if you if you sell land to any of your people or you buy land from your people, you're not supposed to take advantage of each other. There's, I mean, just it was just really laid out how slavery is supposed to happen and what's supposed to happen afterwards, and. You know, it, there's also a, a line in the in, in Leviticus that says, you know, you're really only supposed to take slaves from your neighboring lands. Africa and Europe were nowhere near each other. So if we want to talk about Bible thumping and, and following things to the letter of the Bible, well, you went across the ocean to get people, and you went across another ocean to go to a land that wasn't yours and, and, and build it up. But building it up on the backs of... Um, these kidnapped Africans, our you know forefathers and foremothers, our ancestors. So, what are your thoughts on on? I know you know a little bit of history on reparations. You know, of course, mine is will have to do with Haiti um, and well, what happened with Haiti. So, um, I'll let you handle Haiti. I got some Haiti, some Haitian information, but I'll let you handle that because you know that's your, my, your thing. My thing. Um, but we did, um, I don't know if people know this, but during World War II, Japanese people in America were sent to internment camps. They received their reparations in 1988 by Ronald Reagan, and basically every surviving victim got 20000 And here's the hypocrisy in all of this. Congress had a commission to investigate the internment camps, and I quote, after extensive interviews and personal testimonies from the victims, the commission issued its final report called the incarceration a grave injustice motivated by racial prejudice, war hysteria, and the failure of political leadership. Man, does that sound familiar. War, doesn't it? Doesn't wow. it? Doesn't it sound so familiar? When I saw that, I was thinking, oh my gosh, like it's so weird how, that's why I love history. Because if you are a fan of history, you can literally always see history repeating itself and looking at how things play out. Um, with the, the country of Haiti, what happened with Haiti, the United States and France was the equivalent of the kidnapper suing the kidnapped. In 1825, the Haitian slaves rose up against their kidnapper, and kidnappers and they released themselves from slavery. But in order to remain free, um, Haiti was ordered to repay France for uh, damages and for the price of their freedom, the equivalent in today's dollars of $21 billion, okay? This was back in the day. So Haiti wasn't even allowed to trade with other nations. So if Haiti tried to sell sugarcane to another country, the United States Marines or Navy would confiscate the, the stuff that they were trying to sell. So when we look at Haiti today as being one of the poorest nations in the Western Hemisphere, there is a reason for that. They didn't teach us that in school, but there is a reason for that. I grew up, you know, I'm half Haitian, my father's Haitian, ça passe. And my mother had to teach me so that I wouldn't feel bad about who I was as a child. She taught me, you know, hey, be proud of the fact that your people, you know, freed themselves, but also, you know, Haiti had to pay back a lot of money to France. And Haiti right now is is petitioning France to get their money back. France is one of the richest countries in the world. And also, Haiti was the richest colony in the Caribbean. They free themselves. They at the time they were they were producing 60% of the world's coffee, 40% of the world's sugar. They free themselves and of course the US is not happy because we're, we got slavery going and we're... Yeah, but we were also, and when I say we, the United States was also cool with, with France because yeah. we wouldn't have the United States if it wasn't for France. And also, Haiti was forced to sell their exports to France at a 50% discount. Yes. So they went from one of the richest places in, on the planet to now one of the poorest. Right. Because, my bad, we got free. Yeah, and it took six generations to pay France back, and they did. Haiti today produces nothing. They import lemons from the Dominican Republic. Okay, so let that sink in. When we look at if, if, if a country like Haiti was forced to pay back reparations, the United States, we can have this conversation about reparations for the descendants of slaves. I mean, we look at our economy, we see what's been going on. And even in uh, Germany, when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about what happened with the Germans, West Germany, and the, uh, and the country of Israel, and how they had to repay back. It is Sean Prime from Inside the Loop with myself and Brenna B, and I've been talking about Jeans Body Tech for a minute, simply because it's a premier gym in a pristine spot without a premium price. 
all the weight you need, all the machines you want, free parking, all in Buckhead. Come on, it's crazy. 700 Miami Circle is where you want to work out today. And for those who are feeling a little bit down because you may not have followed through on the healthy New Year resolution thing, hey, it's still the new year. You can start today. Look at yourself a year from now, and hello, is that you? Because you're looking good, like snack-like. Yes, you are. 700 Miami Circle, or go to Facebook.com forward slash Jeans Body Tech, also known as JBT Fitness. Either way, 49 bucks is nothing to pay to feel your best every day. Check Honey, what you cook for dinner tonight? Do you want the good news or the bad news first? The bad news first. I cooked nothing. Well, that's the good news then. Authentic Caribbean cuisine, including vegetarian entrees with authentic Caribbean flavor. Call 770-892-5049, located at 6221 Jonesboro Road, Highway 54 in Morrow, Georgia. Turk Palace. Marie Callender's knows that you may not have time to roll out dough for a perfectly flaky crust that's made from scratch. Or enough time to mix vegetables with all white meat chicken and a homemade gravy. She knows you may not have a moment to crimp the edges of your favorite chicken pot pie. But Marie Callender's does. And when she's done, all you need to do is find time to grab someone special. Sit down and savor. Marie Callender's. It's time to say. Don't just sing the song. I'm living my best life. Do it. And we're here to help with Smart Talk. From programs like this. From your nation's urban station. Online. On SSNATL.com. And we are back with Financial Renaissance with the M's. And you are here with your host, Emma Folks, And our co-host, guest co-host, all the way from Montgomery, Alabama, Jeffrey Wright. Good morning, Jeff. Roll time. Roll time. <laughs> and this Sunday morning, we are deep diving into um, reparations because it is a hot topic that's happening with um, the presidential candidates. And before uh, the break, we talked a little bit about, you know, reparations, um, what the definition was. We talked about what it says in the Bible about slavery um, and how slavery, what is it, the year of Jubilee? And how every 50 years, if you're a slave, slaves should be freed, land should be given back, wealth should be given back. And basically, don't be a, don't be a jerk. You know, treat your neighbors, um, you know, treat your neighbors right. Don't try to take advantage of, of your neighbors. And we, we also talked about what happened with uh, France and Haiti and Haiti having to pay back reparations to the tune of $21 billion to France. And the, what happened with the Japanese Americans when, during World War II, when the United States rounded up, you know, people of Japanese descent on the West Coast and put them in camps. Um, they were given money back. And then in West Germany, after World War, well, World War One and World War Two, after World War One, Germany was forced to pay back a ton of money, which also led them to extreme poverty, which also led them to, you know, kind of where they were able to believe in Hitler, which led to World War Two, right? So Germany had to also pay back, West Germany had to pay back um, the Jewish settlements or Israel to help resettle the Jews after World War II. And, you know, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later in the show, but you brought up um, something during the break about, um, you know, that, that certain people in the United States were paid back um, or were paid reparations for slavery. Yeah, so um, there was reparations payments made for slavery. To the to slave owners. When? Um, I can't, I don't have the year, but Lincoln did it, so it was immediately following the Civil War. So um, U.S. slave owners were paid up to $300 per slave, so that's about 4500 in today's money. To 45000 or 4500 4500 okay. which sounds a little low to me, but okay. um, 4500 4 million slaves, that's about $18 billion in today's dollars. Okay. that were paid to slave owners for to cover lost property. So think about the hypocrisy in that. Like, we're going to fight to free people and then pay you for lost, quote-unquote, property. So it kind of gives you the attitude of what we still were even after the Civil War. Right. 
One of the uh, the things I, I, you know, I, we always hear about the term 40 acres and a mule, you know, Spike Lee's uh, production company. That, that was my first time hearing about it was when I was, I guess it was in the 80s when Spike Lee came out with, um, I don't even remember the name of the movie, School Days. That's what it was, School Days. And I saw the 40 acres and a mule and started to do some digging. And I, I didn't know and I wasn't taught in school um, that the government had promised the um, freed slaves 40 acres and a mule. And... It, it actually happened with General Sherman um, in 1865. There was a um, during the Civil War, the um, the Union soldiers basically told the slaves, like, if you come behind our enemy lines, we got you. Um, after the war, they were like, what well, we're going to do for you? And they had they were in Savannah. Um, I think it was the March of the Sea or Battle to the Sea, where they told them, hey, we would we're going to give you, I believe it's uh, South Carolina, parts of uh, coastal Georgia and um, Florida, we're going to give that, we're going to parcel it up into 40 acres, and this is where we're going to settle um, about 18,000 former enslaved families, okay? And that's, they, that's what they gave them. These were lands that were confiscated during the war from the uh, plantation owners. And, you know, it, it, it sounds great, and there were certain, you know, neighborhoods that continued to thrive and, and things happened, but Lincoln got assassinated. And when Lincoln got assassinated, a lot of things happened in the country. You know, one, you know, they thought there was going to end up being another civil war. And the country didn't want that. And the, um, they ended up, the Union soldiers eventually, um, because of Andrew Johnson, I believe, mm -hmm. um, ended up pulling out of the South. And when they pulled out of the South, it absolutely wrecked havoc. So the reconstruction period that had started, you know, there were black people in office, in, in Congress, in the Senate, because of uh, Reconstruction, you know, a lot of great things were happening. Um, they were, and the most important thing about the 40 acres and a mule is that the slaves were supposed to govern themselves. They were supposed to be self-governing. And I'm also of Jamaican heritage, and there's a group of people in Jamaica called the Maroons. And they freed themselves um, from their masters. They ran into the Blue Mountains. If you like Blue Mountain coffee, that's a little bit of history about the Blue Mountains. And they you know, would come down at night, they would steal weapons and, you know, kind of wreck shop. And finally, the government, the Brits said, hey, you know, if you guys just stay on your own, leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. But if you capture any slaves, bring them back. You know, that was the one thing that they didn't, my family didn't teach me, you know, growing up. But they had to give any slaves back that escaped after a, a certain period. But they were self-governing, and they're still self-governing to this day. So they don't pay taxes, all right? They're, they're kind of a... An, um, you know, they're, they're allowed to do what they want to do, how they want to do it, because of what happened to them during slavery. And, again, that would have been a, a great thing to happen in this country. We wouldn't have half the problems we have uh, if we were just left alone in our, you know, to, left to our own devices. Well, the, the belief also was, even after they freed us, that we could not govern ourselves. We didn't have the mental capacity to do that. So the only way that black people would thrive was under threat of the white whip, basically. So it was, even after we got freed, it was not really freedom. And there, while, while there were some short-lived attempts to kind of allow us to start to do our own thing economically, it was never really any real enthusiasm behind it because they didn't really want to see us do that. And keep in mind that we could thrive on our own because we were the ones who produced literally everything. So we were the farmers, we were the blacksmiths, we made the leather goods, we made the clothes, we did everything. We were the backs of industry in this country and allowed this country to get the wealth that it got simply because it had an advantage that no other place in the world had and that was that it didn't have to pay for labor. Yeah, and I think that scared a lot of, obviously scared a lot of Southerners, but the, the part about that that really gets to me is the South got burned down during the Civil War. And, you know, to me, if, if, if and again, I, I, I can't speak like a Southerner from the, you know, 1800s because I'm not there, but if my neighborhood is decimated, I want to do whatever I can to make sure that I thrive. Like, to me, success is always the best revenge. And I think this country did a disservice to the South after the Civil War and after Lincoln was um, assassinated. Um, but well, that's one of the things that I feel like we're trying to repair. Coming up, we're gonna talk about 
Reconstruction and the Jim Crow era. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Wake up and text. Text and eat. Mm -mm. Text and catch the bus. Text and miss your stop. Wait, 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 wait. Text and be late to work. Sorry, I'm late. Text and work. Text and pretend to work. Text and act surprised when someone calls you out for not working. <clears throat> Me? Text and meet up with a friend you haven't seen in forever. Hi. Oh, hey. Text and complain that they're on their phone the whole time. <sighs> Text and listen to them complain that you're on your phone the whole time. Uh. Text and whatever. But when you get behind the wheel, give your phone to a passenger. Put it in the glove box. Just don't text and drive. Visit StopTextsStopRex.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Adopt US Kids presents Multiple Choice Parenting. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you A, put yourself in her shoes? How could he do this to you? And for Sheila, she, she has split ends. B. Console her. Oh, sweetie. This is going to happen a lot. Four, maybe five more times before you get married. C. Take charge. Got to get this all straightened out. Keep a little talking to, man to man, mano a mano. Hey, Steve. It's now a good time? No? Okay, no problem. Bye. Or D. Help her find a new boyfriend. I know a great place to meet boys. The internet. Nice, single boys. Never mind. How about some ice cream? As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on how you can adopt, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. Opiates has taken everything and everyone I've ever loved away from me. Everything. I blew my ankle out and I got prescribed pain pills by my doctor. If making my detox public is going to help somebody, I'm all for it. I just wish I would have had a warning. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth. Spread the truth. A message from Truth, the Ad Council, and ONDC. Texas, you'll shout out to request. One, six, seven, eight, six, one, three, five, eight, five, seven, three, nine, 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 nine. You're on Financial Renaissance with the M's. You are following us at SSNATL.com or on Facebook Live at Sensation Station Network. Uh, if you want to join in on the conversation on our Facebook page, go ahead and put your comments. Thank you for the comments that have been coming in so far. But if you have any questions or if you want to give us a couple of factoids, because we, we love information here, go ahead and put those, drop those in the comment section. Um, I'd also like on Facebook and Instagram, you can follow the show at Financial Renaissance and also at Emma Knows Money. On Twitter, you can find us at M's Said It and Emma Knows Money. Um, we are talking about um, reparations. We're going to be talking a little bit about Jim Crow. And later on in the show, we're going to tell you how to kind of recession-proof um, your finances for possibly a looming recession that may be coming. Um, but before the break, we talked, we started talking about um, the Civil War, um, who got paid back reparations for uh, the slaves here in the United States. It wasn't us. It was the plantation owners. Mm -hmm. And we talked about uh, Sherman's special field order 15 and how we were promised 40 acres in a mule, but after Lincoln was assassinated, the country was in an upheaval. Um, a lot of people had died, a lot of money was spent, and the country did not want to have another potential civil war because assassinating the Union president was a big deal. Um, and as a result of you know Abraham Lincoln being uh, murdered, um, the Union soldiers 
you know, the un there was a compromise that was made and the Union pulled out of the South. And when the Union pulled out of the South, all the gains that had been made in a very short amount of time by the ex-slaves was reversed and with a quickness. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of got a note, like, what went wrong with Reconstruction? And essentially, America fought to free the slaves, and then America turned its back on the slaves. So um, you had the Civil Rights Bill of 1875. That was basically the 14th and 15th Amendment that gave us well, 13th freedoms, and then we got the right to vote, and then protection from discrimination, that type of stuff. And the Supreme Court turned around and said in 1883, um, civil rights enforcement is a local government issue. So, what do you think the local governments of the South did? <laughs> hey, guys, crank it. Hey, let's get the band back together. Let's crank it up. So, um, at that point, there was slavery still going on. Any allegations of slavery from that point was literally ignored by the federal government and the slavery that ensued after that was the convict leasing programs and if it's a part of our history that is literally not talked about is completely ignored completely swept under the rug they don't talk about it in history books most people know don't even know that this occurred and it was in a lot of ways worse than slavery yeah what what President Lincoln did, he pulled kind of a John McCain in who he was going to have as his running mate for his second term. Um, to appease the South, he picked a man by the name of Andrew Johnson. And Andrew Johnson was a hot mess. Like, he was such an alcoholic that when he was getting sworn in, dude was, like, slurring his words. I mean, he sounds like somebody very familiar. Like I told you, history always repeats itself. You know, he routinely, and this again, slaves had been freed, but he routinely referred to blacks as inferior. Um, he would bluntly state that no matter how much progress the slaves made, made, they should just remain slaves. It doesn't matter. And for the record, so did Lincoln. Yeah, but we're not even going to get into whether Lincoln was a race. Lincoln didn't even want the black people to still remain in the country, but that's a whole other that's a whole that's other show. show. Yeah. So with um, with Johnson, though, he openly. Um, called his critics disloyal, even treasonous. Um, he Absolutely. he th he liberally threw insults around like candy during his speeches. He rudely ignored questions that he didn't like, Thank and you. he regularly put other people in positions that they didn't want to be in. And then he blamed them when things went wrong. Who does that sound like? <laughs> Was he orange? He wasn't, man. But it sounds like bad, somebody we know, bad right? Hair piece. Oh my gosh, man. So, yeah, so President Johnson was probably one of the worst choices. I always blame Rutherford B. Rutherford B. Hayes, but it, it really wasn't him. I mean, he was part of it because he's the one who pulled the Union troops out of the South. Rutherford B. Hayes just sounds like failure. Well, it also sounds like... You ever like, met a uh, successful Rutherford? You ever met a successful Beauregard? Mr. Alabama? <laughs> There's certain, certain names that just sound... <laughs> I'm not. I'm. I'm not going to comment on the border guard thing. Okay. All right. So you got to go home. You got to cross that line later, don't you? You know what? I don't care. Um, <laughs> border guard just sounds like a whip comes with a name. Right. Okay. There we go. So Johnson, President Johnson, turned out to be a, a, a god awful um, uh, uh, vice presidential um, nominee, um, somebody to be on the ticket. But I understand what Lincoln was trying to do. Um, he didn't know he was going to get. Is the proper word murked? Is that what they say? He yeah, he didn't know he was going to get murdered. Um, he didn't think that Johnson would, would run the country, but he did. And Johnson was a Southerner, and Johnson wanted the South to rise again. I think one of the things that really happened in this country, because I think the United States overall let the, let the South down um, by allowing the South to continue with certain types of things that they held true to, by, you know, the Daughters of the Confederate teaching the Southerners. Like, there's a lot of things that I realize that the Southerners, that you as a Southerner didn't learn, and me as a Northerner, that I didn't learn. Like, I didn't know that it's the North's fault for what happened in the South, you know, with the Union troops being pulled out. I was never taught that in school. We were never, I never knew that the North, that the North did anything wrong. Like, what we are taught based on where you live regionally it's skewed based on, you know, making yourself look better. And in the North, we were taught that, man, in the South, you know. <laughs> well, I think, I'm not going to say it was the North's fault. I think it was the country failed as a whole. One, because what happened to the South 
had to happen. But the reason the South was decimated is literally because the whole thing was propped up on free labor. Free labor, yeah. So once that labor was no longer free, there was, I mean, literally like a half of the assets of the South, which the South by itself was one of the wealthiest places you could be in the, in, on, in the world, yeah. simply because half of the assets were slaves. Yeah, and Be Mississippi was the richest state. I mean, Mississippi now? Well, I don't know where they fall. Well, I think they're, they're pretty low at, on the At the, the time of the Civil War, you had 9 million people in the South. 4 million were slaves. Yeah. And that was literally the whole financial backing of that complete economy. Loans were made against slaves. They were collateralized. Um, businesses were run off of slaves. Banks that you have heard of got their start. The City Bank of New, New York. Lehman Brothers was started in Montgomery. What do you think they were doing? Um, loan, fi the cotton industry, which propelled our country, was financed by slaves. So when you pull that out, of course, there's nothing left there. Right. And what the country should have done is kind of what we're talking about now. But instead, and like I said, I can't blame the South because, well, I'm not going to blame the North. I can't blame the South. But what really happened was the South basically decided this was our way of life and there will be slavery. We'll call it something else. Yeah. But it's going to continue. Oh, and did and it? <laughs> yeah, and as soon as the North turned their back, which is what really happened, they didn't pull out, they turned their back. As soon as they turned their back, we went right back into slavery. No, they pulled out. They, they, the troops left. Because, no, 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 I know. But yeah, they, they pulled the out. The people of the North turned, they turned their, their backs. backs. Yeah, they turned their backs because they didn't want to They didn't want to go through another war. They didn't want, you know, wars cost money, and black people just weren't worth it. Plain Essentially, and simple, yeah, they, the, they didn't the care black enough. people just weren't worth it. Like, if, if as an ex-slave, if you didn't leave. Now, the one thing that I do have an issue with, with the Special Order 15, is, to me, again, thinking about the year of Jubilee, if, we're, if we go back to that thought process, you cannot take confiscated, like, you can't think that this was a good idea to give confiscated lands to ex-slaves. The Americas, the America, the continent, is huge, Right. So there are lands in the West that could have been given to us. There's a whole lot of stuff that could have happened to kind of put us, you know, in kind of out of the way. And so we could be left to our own devices. I mean, we didn't have cars back then. <laughs> we didn't well, have I cars. mean, they, they might as well give it to us. Who else was going to form it? Right. So they should have just put us, put, us, put us off to the side. You know, Lincoln had been thinking about sending us to um, the country of Liberia, which when we looked up, which was founded by... <laughs> The Americans, when we look at the flag of, of Liberia, the Liberian flag is the American flag with one star, <laughs> one yeah. giant star. Um, they also talked about, you know, if you Google Lincoln and the Panama plan, um, Lincoln also thought about sending us to northern, what's, you know, today northern Panama, and also to Belize. So there was no, no um, misconception in Lincoln's mind that ex-slaves and the southerners or even the northerners, that ex-slaves were going to be able to live harmoniously in this country. And it was not based on the slaves. We well, were not the problem. We were not the problem, but, you know, hey, generation after generation of being told that people are, like, you know, next to dogs, like, it, it's a mindset. And that's what the southerners were taught growing up, that these people didn't matter. And we do it today. When we look at, you know, um, when we look at homeless people on the street, they don't matter. What do you mean they don't matter? They're Still human beings. Yeah. Oh, I know. Well, yeah. But but people matter. And so it, it's just very mind boggling to me. You know, when we think about the Bible, when we think about uh, religion and then we think about how we actually treat each other as humans, you know, it, it, it kind of you know, gets me choked up a little bit um, when we when we return. We're going to talk about Birmingham, Alabama, and we're going to talk about the headright system. Wake up and text. Text and eat. Mm -mm. Text and catch the bus. Text and miss your stop. Wait, 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 wait. Text and be late to work. Sorry, I'm late. Text and work. Text and pretend to work. Text and act surprised when someone calls you out for not working. <clears throat> Me? Text and meet up with a friend you haven't seen in forever. Hi. Oh, hey. Text and complain that they're on their phone the whole time. <sighs> 
text and listen to them complain that you're on your phone the whole time. Uh. Text and whatever. But when you get behind the wheel, give your phone to a passenger. Put it in the glove box. Just don't text and drive. Visit StopTextsStopRex.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Coming to Tampa Bay, I said we want to win a Super Bowl, and I believe we will. From IamSecond.com, we came close, but never really did win that championship. Former NFL head coach Tony Dungy. At the end of my sixth year, I was fired, and it was one of the biggest disappointments of my life. Next year, I'm in Indianapolis, get to the playoffs, but get knocked out again. And for the next couple of years, it's the same thing. Everyone is saying Colts are never going to win one. And I did wonder why didn't it pan out the way I thought it would. But I determined that I had to have Christ first and that everything else came below that, including my own desires. The next year, that ended up being our year to, to go to the Super Bowl and win it. And it was a wonderful feeling. Every decision I make, I'm going to make it through the lens of Jesus Christ. And he got us to that ultimate victory. I'm Tony Dungy, and I am second. Major Key Alert. Life is like school. You will be tested, so pass it. Learn the real major keys to getting to college at GetSchool.com. Brought to you by Get Schooled and the Ad Council. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. <sighs> Okay. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Coming to Tampa Bay, I said we want to win a Super Bowl, and I believe we will. From IamSecond.com, we came close, but never really did win that championship. Former NFL head coach Tony Dungy. At the end of my sixth year, I was fired, and it was one of the biggest disappointments of my life. Next year, I'm in Indianapolis, get to the playoffs, but get knocked out again. And for the next couple of years, it's the same thing. Everyone is saying Colts are never going to win one. And I did wonder why didn't it pan out the way I thought it would. But I determined that I had to have Christ first and that everything else came below that, including my own desires. The next year, that ended up being our year to, to go to the Super Bowl and win it. And it was a wonderful feeling. Every decision I make, I'm going to make it through the lens of Jesus Christ. And he got us to that ultimate victory. I'm Tony Dungy, and I am second. Honey. What you cook for dinner tonight? You want the good news or the bad news first? The bad news first. I cooked nothing. Well, that's the good news then. Uh-huh. Well, there's no bad news then because tonight we're going to have Jerk Palace. Call Jerk Palace for authentic Caribbean cuisine, including vegetarian entrees with authentic Caribbean flavor. Call 770-892-5049. Located at 6221 Jonesboro Road, Highway 54 in Morrow, Georgia. Jerk Palace. This is big business. This is the American West. Station, Station Network. City of... And we're back with Financial Renaissance with the M's. I'm your host, Emma Folks, and we have a guest, my special guest host today, Jeffrey Wright, my dude. What's like, going on? What's going on, people? Listen, uh, go ahead and put your comments in our uh, comment section on Sensation Station Network on Facebook, or you can join in the conversation by texting us at 678 613 This morning, we are shredding the theory of bootstrapping. Um, you know, that there's a common, you know, when we talk about um, the economic gaps, when we talk about the disparities of wealth in this country, one of the things that we're always met with is, well, we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps, you know, um, and, and we're going to get into a little bit later about what Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had to say about reparations and bootstrapping. Um, but let's, we, before the break, we talked, we were talking a little bit about convict leasing. Mm -hmm. Can you um, 
can you tell everyone what 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 convict leasing is? In a very or was, simple or still is. Yeah, still is. <laughs> still is. Still going on. Very simply, convict leasing was slavery. Yeah. We just named it something different. So immediately after Reconstruction, we got put back into the fields. We got put back into the mines and the furnaces that were um, industrialized in the South. So essentially what would happen is, is they passed black codes. And if you were black, you living your life was essentially against the law. So they had vagrancy laws. If you didn't work, then you would be arrested. At the time in the South, nobody was working, but it didn't specifically say in the laws that... What do you mean in that, at that time in the South, no one was working? No one was working. There was, look, the labor, the, the free labor was gone. White people weren't working, they had us. So we had the jobs, Right. Okay. okay. if you want to call them a job. But right. anyway, um, so they began to round up black men mainly, and then also black women and also black children to do labor. And what would happen is, is you got arrested, they would say, hey, you're fi you have to pay these fines. Of course, nobody had any money to pay the fines, so then they would say, you have to work it, you have to work it off. There were times where, um, basically prison camps were Dude, that sounds like today man that sounds like any poor city in america that has like whether it's poor white people poor black people like i'm gonna bust you i'm, I'm gonna give you a ticket for a busted tail light oh, but, but 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 it was worse because there were prison camps in alabama where there would be like 1100 prisoners and they could only find that 40 of them actually had charges against them but those, was that the chain gang back then yes every, okay so essentially um it became a major part of the southern economy, just like slavery, to do convict leasing to the point where in Alabama, the governor of Alabama leased all of the state's convicts to a railroad company. 350 men were leased for $5 for six years. Not $5 a year, $5 total for six years for 350 people to go be prison labor. So again, if we're looking at men, men who are, you know, who had the majority of the jobs, uh, you know, back in the day, and you take them out of the communities and you put them in prison, we're talking about wealth gap. We are definitely talking about the uh, wealth gap. Coming up next, we're going to jump into Birmingham, Alabama, and their history of reparations. <laughs> It is Sean Prime from Inside the Loop with myself and Brenna B. And I've been talking about Jeans Body Tech for a minute simply because it's a premier gym in a pristine spot without a premium price. All the weight you need, all the machines you want, free parking, all in Buckhead. Come on, it's crazy. 700 Miami Circle is where you want to work out today. And for those who are feeling a little bit down because you may not have followed through on the healthy New Year resolution thing, hey, it's still the new year. You can start today. Look at yourself a year from now and hello, is that you? Because you're looking good, like snack-like. Yes, you are. 700 Miami Circle, or go to Facebook.com forward slash Jeans Body Tech, also known as JBT Fitness. Either way, 49 bucks is nothing to pay to feel your best every day. Already coaching? Everybody's a coach these days. I get it. Life coach, relationship coach, financial coach. But you want to be a coach with integrity. So get certified and do it the right way. Or add coaching to the work that you already do. Join a cohort or take classes at your own pace. We have knowledgeable instructors. We have a life-changing curriculum. Go to academyofcreativecoaching.com to learn more. Some knowledge belongs to us and us alone. The way our girlfriends walk, talk, touch their hair. Details that only a sister can know about her girls. But what about our other girls? The ones we carry with us every day. Our bond with our sister girls gives life. But knowing your breasts can save it. Go to knowyourgirls.org for the facts you need on breast health. Brought to you by Susan G. Coleman and the Ad Council. Energizing a nation, one listener at a time. It's SSNATL.com. Radio that's not dumbed down. You're listening to Financial Renaissance with the M's. And we are talking today with our special guest, Jeffrey Wright. Special guest host, Jeffrey Wright. We are talking about um, the theory of bootstrapping. 
and how in America it, it's a common thing for one, everyone wants to tell you how, and a lot of our presidential candidates do it, how, you know, they grew up in a log cabin and they pull themselves up by their bootstraps and if we could do it, you could do it too. But, you know, we were talking before, um, you know, the, the last few segments about what happened after slavery, um, how the North turned their back on the Africans or the, the ex-slaves in the South, and how slavery jumped off again in a different form um, and it was called convict leasing. And Jeffrey, you know, you are a Southerner. You were born and raised in Alabama. Can you tell us a little bit about the cities of Birmingham and Atlanta and how the cities of Birmingham and Atlanta, how they were built or rebuilt after the Civil War? Um, in short, again, I like to keep it simple. We did it. We who? Black folks. Okay. For free. Again. So. In Birmingham, Birmingham, all Birmingham was like the banking capital of the South. It was one of the, it was like one of the leaders of the Industrial Revolution of the South, and the reason that happened is because Birmingham had all the ingredients, um, coal, iron, limestone. They had all the ingredients you needed to make steel. So we had black coal miners. We had black coal miners getting black love. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> Look, so we had. Everything we needed to make steel, steel was a big deal because you need that for the railroads and for construction and everything else. So, leading up to the Civil War, we used steel, of course, to make weapons for the, you know, for the, for the Confederacy. Right. Who do you think was making it? Who do you think was in the mines? Who do you think was in the furnace? I never thought about that, dude. Yeah, so, all around central Alabama, there were mines going. And the, the plantation owners realized I can make more money with my slave if I leased him to these companies to go make this stuff than if I actually did it, than I, if I actually kept him on the plantation. So it started there, Civil War ends, and then convict leasing takes off again because they need these guys, these black men, to go into these mines to help make steel. And literally all the railroads in the South, all of them, were built by Actually. convicts. Built by us. Well, they weren't really convicts, though. No, they were slaves. Um, the Industrial Revolution of the South that made Birmingham what it is now, that made Atlanta what it is now, was done by slaves. And you have to understand, before the end of the Civil War, hardly anybody actually went to prison. We didn't, as a country, we didn't like incarceration. We thought it was impractical and we thought it was expensive. But as soon as the black folks got free, oh, we need it now. So. You had a company in Atlanta called Chattahoochee Brick Company. It was a huge deal. They made 300,000 bricks a day, in a day. Wow. And it was literally called a death camp for um, convicts. And most of the people who entered into convict leasing died within the first, really, two to four years. It was, they, they were really worked, to, death they were worked, worked to, death. to death. They were literally so worked to death. So if you were a slave, you had some kind of value because somebody paid money to get you. If you were a convict, they didn't care because they'd just go get somebody else. So they literally would work you to death. But Chattahoochee Brick Company in Atlanta, 300,000 bricks a day. In 1909, Georgia abolishes prison labor. And literally, Chattahoochee Brick Company is no longer profitable as soon as they don't have prison labor. Birmingham, Sloss Furnace, Pratt Mines. Some of the wealthier names of Alabama history, the Comers, the DeBar... I think it's the Bartolabans, something like that. Um, they got their fortunes off of running these mines, and those mines were run with slave labor. And it continues today, but back then it was particularly nasty because literally you were just picked up and taken to prison just for being black. I mean, literally anything you did. Yeah, you didn't have to commit a crime, um, and it could have been an implied crime. It could have been someone saying, as, as many times happened um, in the South and just in America, period, if a white woman said a black man looked at her, smiled at her, whistled at her, winked at her, uh, was breathing the same air as her, you know, they were going to go to jail. Um, and also another part of it was the, the sheriffs, the judges, all the people in our law enforcement before they were just literally settling civil disputes. Once convict leasing came into play, they actually began to get paid to, they, they, yeah, they got paid they get, fees for finding black labor and sending them to prison camps. So 
it got to the point where literally even everyday citizens were rewarded for helping find quote unquote black convicts yes and you can find a black convict anywhere if you find one on the street they didn't have to be they didn't have to commit a crime they just had to be black between the height of four foot nine and six foot three and they fit the bill yeah and the bigger he was the more you oh, got paid yeah yes. yes oh yes that that's a uh, you know it, it it's a again it's it's one of those things where when people talk about pulling themselves up by their bootstraps you know, how do you pull yourself up by the bootstraps if every time you move forward, there are people dragging you back five steps? And when we, when we look at people being dragged back, you have to think about generational wealth. You have to think about if you, if your husband, if you're, you know, a, a you know, family, wife, couple of kids, you know, well, they had more than a couple back then because you had to make sure your kids lived and you have people to work the land. So wife, father, you know, five children, and dad gets put in jail and your teenage sons get put in jail, what happens to your homestead? If women were not, you know, these people weren't educated, so they couldn't read, they couldn't write, they couldn't do math, they weren't allowed to, although many of them, as soon as they were able to learn, they learned. Um, but if the, if the men were pulled out of the communities, how do you think that community was going to thrive in a male-dominated society? Was the community meant to thrive? The community was not meant to thrive, but my point is how you cannot look at a community that was set up for failure and then say to them, you should have pulled yourself up by your bootstraps just like we did. You know, you drove around last night in Bucket, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're in Georgia. He was trying to get his baby girl, Maya, to sleep last night. It worked. <laughs> it's the funniest thing in the world watching him, like, freak out because he can't sleep. Like, I'm, I'm loving it. <laughs> I never could. It's just... <laughs> No, nah, I don't get the choice. So they were driving around the governor's mansion area and were like, man, these are these are nice homes. What do these lottery winners do? And et cetera. And I had to let them know that there's a lot of old money um, here in Atlanta that we see. And, you know, we look at these homes and we're like, man, what are these people doing? Well, they didn't do anything. A lot of this wealth was passed down to them from, you know, their, their great, 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 great grandfathers. Well, a lot of their great, great, great grandfathers made their wealth on the backs of our grandfathers. So now to look at me or to look at Jeffrey and to say, you know, hey, why aren't you guys at the same, you know, level that we are financially? Why is it that a lot of African Americans have, how much was it in their savings account? $11? What was that number? Yeah, it's like $11. $11 in, in their savings account and the average white family has how much? Um, I think it was like a couple thousand, something like that. I mean, it's not, it's not a high number, but it, it is a difference. But even the net worth numbers are, are, are pretty jarring. And we'll, we're going to end up talking about that in a, in a couple of, um, in like one of the next segments that we have. But it, it's just, it's one of those things that it's like a constant slap in the face. You know, again, I don't want your wealth, but don't tell me that I'm in the position that I'm in because me or my family didn't do what they were supposed to. And it's, it's convenient for America because then we can kind of blame each individual community for why they're in the situation there. And we have this idea of individual ruggedness, and that's the bootstrap. You work hard enough, you get there. And it, that's, that's all garbage, honestly, because yeah. it's just done to excuse what was done to these communities that are in those situations, mainly the black community. And a lot of these communities thrived and they thrived and they got burned down and they thrived and they got burned down and they thrived and they got burned down. And it's not like black people want what white people have. As black people, we just want to be left alone to thrive. Still to come, we are going to be talking about the Paris Reparations Agreement of 1946 on financial renaissance with the M's. <laughs> I'm more resourceful than I thought. My suit can still make an impression. My video games are still game changers. And my lamp can bring others a bright future. Because when I donate my stuff to Goodwill, it helps fund job placement and training for people right in my community. Now my stuff gets a second chance. And will give someone in my community a second chance to Goodwill. Donate stuff, create jobs. Find your nearest donation center at Goodwill.org. That's Goodwill.org. This message brought to you by Goodwill and the Ad Council.
say everyone should have one. I'm thinking about getting me an appointment. Already coaching? Everybody's a coach these days. I get it. Life coach, relationship coach, financial coach. But you want to be a coach with integrity. So get certified and do it the right way. Or add coaching to the work that you already do. Join a cohort or take classes at your own pace. We have knowledgeable instructors. We have a life-changing curriculum. Go to academyofcreativecoaching.com to learn more. Everybody successful lays a blueprint out. You laid a blueprint out. I stayed true to my dreams. And by doing that, eventually it came true. A lot of times, you know, it's like in life, right? Life brings like drama and you got to deal with this person and the funky <laughs> relationship here and all these things. You try and just kind of balance them out as best I can. Make a choice, right? You just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. Just decide. And then from that point, the universe is going to get out Everybody your way. Everybody wants to be a beast until it's time to do what real beasts do. Unleash your beast. Break your history. And you are back with Financial Renaissance with the M's. Thank you for the comments. Thank you for the conversations. We are on Sensation Station Network on Facebook Live. And we can also be reached uh, by texting us at 678-613-5857. Jeffrey, how can people follow you on Twitter? Jeff Knows Money. Jeff Knows Money. And you can follow me at M's Said It, E-M-M-S Said It, and Emma Knows Money. Also on YouTube, you can search for me at Emma Knows Money, and you can subscribe. I think I have two subscribers, my mom and my dad. I'll make it three. Thank you, buddy. I'll do what I can. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, hit that subscribe button. And also like... Um, if you're on, if you're watching us live uh, on Sensation Station Network, please uh, like us or give us a thumbs up so the producer knows, you know, that we're doing a good job. He, he's and, a, and share the video. Share the. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Share the video. Thank you. Definitely. So before the break, we talk. We're talking about um, or dissecting the theory of pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps, and. You know, we talked a little bit, you and I, you know, when, when Jeffrey, and, Jeffrey and I talk almost every day, um, via text, via group me, I mean, he's one of the few people in the world that can hang with all the knowledge and the research and the, the rabbit holes that I go down. And one of the things that you brought up that I was not aware of was redlining. Um, after World War II, there were some certain things that were, were, were put in place Mm -hmm. um, to after World War II, the United States wanted to help the middle class or create a middle class, and there were certain things that were put in place to help people become homeowners, to make things a heck of a lot easier. And home ownership is one of the first steps to uh, wealth building, um, especially in this country. And you know, as we were doing our research, well, you already knew this, but for me, it was a little, you know, I don't always believe what I, what I find. And so that's who I, Jeffrey's who I use to bounce my ideas off of or bounce facts off of, because especially if I've never heard of it. And uh, redlining was one of those. Mm -hmm. So um, after World War II, there was, there was a push made by our federal government to literally create a white middle class. And I, and I do single out yeah. the white middle class part of it because all these policies that were put into place we could not access so redlining was done by the FHA Federal Housing Administration and what that um, entity was created to do was to make home ownership accessible to the masses and they insured the mortgages which caused a drop in the interest rates also caused a drop in the down payment required and so it allowed suburbia to essentially happen and everybody could now get a home loan if you were white i was like so not everybody what but the fha it, did the but F everybody was promised yes of, of course now everybody, not was, just pro yeah, everybody was promised because the soldiers even the black soldiers that came back after world war ii like everybody felt like when they came home like it was on going to be and, on and, and popping that's a we'll, we'll get on that yeah one. um so what the fha did was the they decided what neighborhoods they would insure and back mortgage loans in. So if you were a great neighborhood, you got a green, you, your, your map was colored green, and then you had yellow, and then you had red. So that's where the term redlining comes from. What were the red neighborhoods? Any neighborhood with a black person. 
if it was all white, it got green. If it was a transition in place where maybe it looked like some black people were moving in with possibility, you know, 20% chance of black, they got yellow. Red was, okay, black folks are in this neighborhood. We are not going to back the mortgages there. Now, we still bought homes, but think about the cost and everything that went into that because there were predatory lenders that came in that space. We literally were locked out of being able to get loans. So between 1934, when the FHA was founded, and 1962, the government backed $120 billion of home loans. 98% of those went to white people. And then also, again, when we look at, at, at wealth building, if you buy a home and your property does not or cannot appreciate because it, it, it is in a redlined district where um, you cannot get mortgages, how are you going to be able to pass wealth on, you know, the whole purpose of buying a house is so that when you sell it, you know, there's a little bit of come up behind it, right? So next up, we're going to be jumping into the Paris Accord and also what Martin Luther King Jr. had to say about reparations on Financial Renaissance with the M's. <laughs> Long time no see. It's me, the rock t-shirt in the back of your closet. Dude, remember? You crowd surfed in me, man. But you haven't worn me in like forever. I get it, you're retired, but I still got some rock left in me. So take me to Goodwill, where I could really make a difference. Your donations to Goodwill create jobs, training programs, and education assistance for people in your community. To find your nearest donation center, go to goodwill.org. Donate stuff. Create jobs. A message from Goodwill and the Ad Council. No word in the English language is less convincing than probably. Are you sure we should get matching tattoos on our first date? Sure. Um, we'll probably stay together. Probably? <laughs> it's been 23 minutes since I ate. <laughs> I can probably swim. Uh, you should wait 30 minutes. Mm, okay, now tell me what to do. Cannonball! Cramp! Oh, I have a cramp. I can probably hit the green from here. Probably. Can I get a mulligan? Ready to go? Hey, are you sure you're okay to drive? Yeah, I'm pretty sober. Yeah, I'm probably okay. Probably okay isn't okay, especially when it comes to drinking and driving. If you're drinking, call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. One in seven Americans will struggle with addiction during their lifetime. Want to know how you can help? Go to heretolisten.com for tips and tools to help turn addiction around. A public service announcement brought to you by the Ad Council. Indoor baseball, anyone? Most party fouls are pretty dumb, but if you decide to drink and drive underage, you could lose your license and your freedom. Learn more at ultimatepartyfoul.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Wake up and text. Text and eat. Mm -mm. Text and catch the bus. Text and miss your stop. Wait, 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 wait. Text and be late to work. Sorry, I'm late. Text and work. Text and pretend to work. Text and act surprised when someone calls you out for not working. <clears throat> Me? Text and meet up with a friend you haven't seen in forever. Hi. Oh, hey. Text and complain that they're on their phone the whole time. <sighs> Text and listen to them complain that you're on your phone the whole time. Uh... Text and whatever. But when you get behind the wheel, give your phone to a passenger. Put it in the glove box. Just don't text and drive. Visit StopTextsStopRex.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Viola Davis. Did you know that one in five kids in America struggle with hunger? Growing up, I was one of those kids. But we can solve this. When we make breakfast happen for kids in our neighborhood, we have the power to end childhood hunger, create bigger, brighter school days, and healthier minds and bodies. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice. We're hungry for more. A message from the Albertsons Companies Foundation and the Entertainment Industry Foundation. Energizing a nation, one listener at a time. It's SSNATL.com. Radio that's not dumbed down. 
we're back with Financial Renaissance with the M's and Jeff. M and Jeff. Hey. Sound like Mutt and Jeff. Isn't that a... <laughs> I have no idea what that is. I think it was a cartoon back in the day. And we are, we are um, talking about a very uh, hypersensitive third rail topic of reparations. Uh, what happened with the uh, descendants of kidnapped Africans in this country. Um, we are talking about the wealth gap in our country and the disparities um, and, and what happens when the government comes up with programs to appease us um, of the, about the wealth gap. And, you know, I want to jump into um, a video that I found uh, this week. You told me you saw it last year, um, what Martin Luther King Jr. had to say about reparations. And I, I'm going to tell you now, we're going to end up doing a show on one of the last speeches that Martin Luther King Jr. gave about the other America. Um, but when it comes to reparations, you know, he says, and I quote, or said in 1967, so this was after um, the I Have a Dream speech. And one of the things about Martin Luther King Jr., you know, as a child, I wasn't a fan of Martin Luther King Jr. I wasn't a fan of Mar Martin Luther King Jr. because what they taught us about Dr. King was, you know, um, the We Shall Overcome, um, the I have a dream speech turn the other cheek. Yeah, turn the other cheek So it was a lot of things that just in my own spirit just went against how I felt and so I just always kind of looked at you know Southern blacks and Martin Luther King is just you know not really understanding What he was doing and I never learned anything that he had to say economically about black people and so when I, when I started doing my research and really digging into who he was and what he was all about, you know, it's, it's fascinating, it's mind-blowing, and, and it's also a huge disservice to not teach African-American children in this country all the wide spectrum of what Dr. King was talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So when it comes to reparations, there was an NBC interview that he did in, here in Atlanta in um, 1967. And they asked him, the reporter asked him, why is it that blacks, you know, that <laughs> why is it that blacks are just not doing so well? Is it because they're black? And so Dr. King said, you know, it, 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 to summarize it, it's a cruel jest to say that a bootless man, to a bootless man, that he ought to lift himself up by his bootstraps. And many Negroes by the thousand, thousands and millions have been left bootless. And as a result of a society that deliberately has made his color a stigma. So you can't tell a person that has no boots that they should be, you know, pull themselves up by their bootstraps, and you cannot tell a black person that they should pull themselves up by their bootstraps when their color has been a stigma. And again, you know, jumping into the wealth gap, you know, there are, you know, again, it's not we want what you have, in my opinion, what I want is to be left alone. Like, let us flourish without getting in our way. You know, that, that, that's just my opinion. What did you want to say about the wealth gap? So um, when we say wealth gap, let's put some numbers let's, to it. Yes. Um, so as of, I think the latest thing we got from the census was in like 2013, and it may be a more recent study, but that's the one I found, that's the one I continue to find. But black net worth then was $9,000 per household. White net worth was 132000 per household. So in that same report, um, it literally says that wealth and financial stability are inextricably linked to housing opportunity and home ownership. For a typical family, the largest share of their wealth emanates from home ownership and home equity. So there's this idea that the reason black people are where they are is because we don't work hard enough and we don't you know, we, we, wait, we don't, wait, we don't wait, pull wait, ourselves wait, wait, wait. up so, on the So, what it, so oh, right, real, real talk, real talk. So, I don't know too many black households, and if you're, you know, if you're a non-black person and you're, you're listening to us today, I want you to find a, a black person at work tomorrow or your black friend, um, and I want you to ask them what they were taught in their household about work ethic. I want you to, I want you to ask them, how much harder, what did their parents tell them they had to do in order to be successful? Well, and, and, and let, let's just make a point here. I'm just, I'm, I'm keeping it 100. Okay, so. PG-13. It's going to be okay. I'm just appropriate. Saying. I'm just saying, okay, 
we weren't lazy until we didn't want to work for free anymore. Very true. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Do, do you know how crazy it sounds to say we're lazy and you literally made a job of a two-year voyage by ship across water to go get the lazy people to be your labor? You know how lazy you got to be to make a job out of going to get lazy people, quote unquote? No, we built we built the country. We weren't lazy when we were doing it for free, but then when we say, hey, not only, we're not saying we're not going to do it, we just want to get paid for doing it. Right. Now you're lazy. Right. Yeah, right. So anyhow, it's it's not work ethic. We we know that, but literally, if all of if the majority of net worth is tied into home ownership, and we just went over what the FHA did to block us from home ownership, there's still mortgage discrimination going on now. Essentially, if you don't have a friend at a mortgage company or a friend who is a banker, you're not gonna get a mortgage. It's gonna be very difficult, regardless as African American of income, because you know there is this ideal once you start making so much money. No, um, Jay Z had that song, um, "Story of OJ." Still, right. And and we in the research that we were doing, there was a woman um, that you were telling me about that. Yeah, and in, in, in um, Philadelphia, it was a woman. She made sixty thousand dollars a year. A black woman made sixty thousand dollars a year. Applied for mortgages, continued to get declined. They kept asking her to provide more and more documentation. Then she goes and has her half white, half Japanese partner co-sign on the loan the partner only made a hundred and fifty dollars every two weeks so three hundred dollars a month and they approved the loan immediately <laughs> because her half japanese half white partner. partner with three that three hundred dollars of income a month is what did it right sure and and for us it's a it is a constant you know slap in the face but coming up we're going to continue down this wealth gap um, rabbit hole, and then we're going to start talking about what the uh, 2020 presidential candidates are saying here on Financial Renaissance with the M's. You use Tearless Baby Shampoo because it's gentle on your baby's eyes. You make sure his toys don't have any sharp edges. You always test the bath water to make sure it's not too hot. You taught her what to do when the smoke alarm goes off. You make sure she wears a helmet when she rides her bicycle. You put on his sunscreen, even when he's embarrassed his friends will see. You do so much to keep your child safe. But are you using the right car seat for your child? Is your child facing the right way in the car seat? Is the seat too big or too small? How do you know when it's time to move your child into the next type of seat? Car crashes are a leading killer of children ages 1 to 13. Protect your child's future at every stage of life. For information on the right seat for your child, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. That's safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Why is Connor having trouble focusing in school? Having trouble finding Connor's middle school? Would you like directions? No. Why is Connor having trouble focusing in school? Finding lowest airfare to Istanbul. No, I'm, I'm tired of fighting with him over homework. Home, walk, restaurant. Need a review? No, I need help. He's very smart, but his mind wanders. He's disordered. Organized. I think I understand. Oh, God. Finding best potatoes for French fries. No! Russet. Fingerling. Yukon uh, Gold. Why don't you understand me? Sorry, I was trying to show how Connor feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. For the one in five kids with learning and attention issues, this is what life can feel like. Explore understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues designed to help your child thrive in school and in life. Understood.org, because understanding is everything. Brought to you by understood.org and the Ad Council. Wake up and text. Text and eat. Text and catch the bus. Text and miss your stop. Wait, 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 wait. Text and be late to work. Sorry, I'm late. Text and work. Text and pretend to work. Text and act surprised when someone calls you out for not working. <clears throat> Me? Text and meet up with a friend you haven't seen in forever. Hi. Oh, hey. Text and complain that they're on their phone the whole time. Uh. Text and listen to them complain that you're on your phone the whole time. Uh. Text and whatever. But when you get behind the wheel, give your phone to a passenger. Put it in the glove box. Just don't text and drive. 
Visit StopTextsStopRex.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Some knowledge belongs to us and us alone. The way our girlfriends walk, talk, touch their hair. Details that only a sister can know about her girls. But what about our other girls? The ones we carry with us every day. Our bond with our sister girls gives life. But knowing your breasts can save it. Go to knowyourgirls.org for the facts you need on breast health. Brought to you by Susan G. Coleman and the Ad Council. Adopt U.S. Kids presents Multiple Choice Parenting. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you A, put yourself in her shoes? How could he do this to you? And for Sheila, she, she has split ends. B, console her. Oh, sweetie, this is going to happen a lot. Four, maybe five more times before you get married. C, take charge. Got to get this all straightened out. Keep a little talking to, man to man, mano a mano. Hey, Steve! It's now a good time? No? Okay, no problem. Bye. Or D, help her find a new boyfriend. I know a great place to meet boys. The internet. Nice, single boys. Never mind. How about some ice cream? As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on how you can adopt, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt U.S. Kids, and the Ad Council. Don't just sing the song. I'm living my best life. Do it. And we're here to help with Smart Talk. From programs like this, from your nation's urban station. Online on SSNATL.com. And we are back with Financial Renaissance with the M's and Jeffrey Wright. And we are talking about reparations and the wealth gap. And what it is about slavery, why is it that, you know, I, I once heard someone say, I wish you guys would just get over it already. Like, just get over slavery. It's old news. It's something that happened a long time ago. Well, it's very difficult to say that to someone when your grandparents or your great-great-grandparents or just by virtue of you not being black benefited by our work, our hard work. This microphone keeps hitting me in the mouth, Sean. <laughs> um, <so laughs> I want to give a shout-out to some of, uh, some of our um, people that are listening to us today. Raya. Is that was that at Prime Raya, uh, Ludwig, Karen K, Birdman, La Pearl. Thanks, La Pearl. Like thanks, La Pearl and Rodell, and Raya. Is that Ray? I think Raya is Ray. Who's Ray? That's my son. What? It's my baby boy. <laughs> so what's up, Ray? What's up, Ray? Um, we are um, we were talking before the break. We were talking about the the wealth gap. And the difference in the household net worth between a uh, African American family and a white family, and and we have the stats for the Latino families, we have the stats for Asian families. There's lots of minorities that were impacted. One of the other things that Dr. King said that we all have to think about in relations to how the Negro color has been stigmatized, um, we also have to think about. And the fact that we as black people were the only people enslaved on this land. We were the only people, you know, so the Irish came over as indentured servants. A lot of the British people, you know, when we look at, first of all, the whole white culture is really based on what happened in, in the United Kingdom. And anybody else that came over was ostracized. So the Germans were ostracized, you know, like um, rep, um Prohibition had to do with Germans making too much money, <laughs> and so the uh, the Brits, the people of British descent, were upset about that. So that had a lot to do with Prohibition. But the Irish that came over were were ostracized. The Italians that came over were ostracized. The Polish that came over, were, I mean, every eth other anybody that was not British is considered ethnic. But all these people that came over, even if they came over as indentured indentured servants, they were eventually freed, and they were eventually from a caste system, which we try to act like we don't have in this country, but we do. At the bottom of the totem pole were the, the, the descendants of slaves or slaves. And so here we are today, you know, still, you know, kind of overcoming a lot of stuff that happened centuries ago, and it's wired into a lot of people's psyche. 
but it's the wrong thing wired into people's psyche. Again, why can't you get over slavery? Well, let's look at our net worths, and then you tell me why we can't get over it. Yeah, and, and the other thing, too, is, is let's just not leave it at slavery, because there was this thing called Jim Crow. Oh, yeah, we didn't even touch that on that. That lasted 100 years after slavery. So for everybody who's hollering, oh, it was old news, no, it wasn't. Jim Crow ended in like 1965. With the Civil Rights Act. There wouldn't have been a need for the Civil Rights Act if people did not brutalize African Americans or people of, of color in the South or in this country after slavery. There, yeah. would, be, there would be absolutely no need for that. Yeah, so uh, segregation outlawed 1964. The Civil War ended in 1865. We didn't get the right to vote until 1965 and, and guys just to put that in perspective for everybody who's like oh it was so long ago i was born in 1982 we had not had the right to vote for 20 years total. I, was, I was born in 1969 yes so four, and we had the right to vote for four, four whole years, years. so a and segregation was outlawed in 64. so again i'm born in 82 segregation had only been not even been outlawed 20 years when I was born, and it's not like they said, hey, segregation is illegal, and everybody said, all right, man, we'll play right. Right. No. So the, the reparations has to do with more than just slavery. It's also a lot of the things, as he talked about the convict leasing, there are whole towns and communities that were thriving, that were burnt to the ground. There were so many things that have happened, and, and one of the most mind-boggling things, I mean, you and I went to the, um, the Legacy Memorial, mm -hmm in, um, in Montgomery. Montgomery, Alabama last year. We went to the museum on opening day. And, you know, Jeffrey and I, we clown around a lot. I mean, we're always joking. We're always, you know, real jovial. On our way to uh, the museum, it was raining. And I remember joking in the car, saying that it was the tears of our ancestors. Yeah, it got real. And we were he he ki 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 it up. And then once we got into that museum, and we saw the holograms of the children crying for their parents and the parents crying, asking for their kids. Like, things got really, real, really, really fast for, for me. Um, it was an experience that I'd never felt before. And, you know, one of the things that really blew my mind was the slavery, the fact that there are more African-American men um, in prison than there were as slaves. That, that absolutely boggles my mind. But stay tuned. We're going to jump into the more, a little bit more into the actual numbers for reparation, what that should look like on Financial Renaissance with the M's. My savings are gone. Okay, where were they last? Here, right before I spent them on that vacation to Aruba. Weird. Not weird. Not saving now means no money later. For free ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. So, I'm a dog, and I just got adapted by this new human guy, and I'm starting to wonder how he got along without me. I mean, okay, something as simple as walking around the block. He's got this leash thing, and he puts me on one end and him on the other, and I'm just taking him around. I, I think he's afraid of getting lost. Without that leash and me guiding him along, I don't think he'd find his way back home. But it's kind of cute. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. It is Sean Prime from Inside the Loop with myself and Brenna B. And I've been talking about Jeans Body Tech for a minute simply because it's a premier gym in a pristine spot without a premium price. All the weight you need, all the machines you want, free parking, all in Buckhead. Come on, it's crazy. 700 Miami Circle is where you want to work out today. And for those who are feeling a little bit down because you may not have followed through on the healthy New Year resolution thing, hey, it's still the new year. You can start today. Look at yourself a year from now, and hello, is that you? Because you're looking good, like snack-like. Yes, you are. 700 Miami Circle, or go to Facebook.com forward slash Jeans Body Tech, also known as JBT Fitness. Either way, 49 bucks is nothing to pay to feel your best every day. If you're looking for that ratchet, you're in the wrong place. It's the nation's urban internet station, sensation station network. <laughs> back with financial renaissance with the m's and our special guest jeffrey wright and if you're looking for the ratchet it's not here is that what we just heard 
The ratchet is here. The ratchet is here. The ratchet is here. The ratchet is here. Well, listen, we were, we, <laughs> we were talking about reparations. We're talking about the uh, the 2020 presidential candidates, and I, I guess they really want the African American vote. Um, and so they're bringing up reparations and reparations. I, I think one of the representatives, James Claiborne, or one of these guys, he brings up he brings up a bill for reparations every, every year. year, every single year he brings it up. But now we've 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 got a little bit of, of of heat underneath it because there are presidential candidates, you know, all 85 of them, and a lot of them are talking about reparations and they're coming up with different theories of how to how to do it no matter what you want to do you're not going to be you're not going to be able to there's no dollar amount that is going to be able to undo the a lot of the damage that has happened to the black families we are now recovering i think this generation the ones under us are are doing a great job of getting our family unit whole again uh, we have the best fathers in the country right yes. now the most attentive fathers um, we also have the most educated women in the country um no, no, and, no. Not the most educated women. Black women are the most educated segment, period. Period. Um, so, you know, we are doing what we need to do. And again, not to take anything away from anybody else, just basically fall back. Let us do what we need to do because we are going to carry the country into the 21st century. The country is not going to move forward by still acting like we were acting in the 1950s. If, if you want to go back that way, you know, there are planes that can take you to Europe and you can go back to your, <laughs> your father's land and you can go chill out there. Um, some of the presidential candidates have been talking about, you know, um, opening up uh, savings accounts for new babies that are being born and giving them a thousand dollars a year in savings bonds or some type of bonds for, um, for every year until they turn 21 or something like that. Other people have been saying to give, you know, households like, um, I think it's like twenty thousand dollars there's all these different theories and then there's of course the dissenters how are we going to pay for it how are we going to pay for it but remember what happened in 2017 with the tax cuts like let, let's let's run down some of these reparations numbers um, okay so um most of the candidates are saying they're not for actually giving us just writing us a check right they want to set aside monies for programs and everything as if that'll bridge the gap that the government created. I don't think any more programs, because when we look at programs from affirmative action, when we look at a lot of the programs that were set in place after um, the civil rights bill was passed, like, I don't want that. I think give the people their cash at this point. I know what I need better than anybody else. So the government policies created basically a $100,000 wealth gap between black households and white households. There are no programs you're going to put in place that will bridge that $100,000 gap unless you actually give those people the $100,000. Now, people have, been saying, people have been saying, oh, we'll, we'll give tax breaks, we'll provide a, a free education, we'll do this, we'll do that. With everything that the government has giveth, they have taken away. So what we're saying is, you know, I'm in agreement with stroking a check. Yeah, and let, let just put some numbers behind it. Let's put some numbers behind it. You got 43-something million black folks in the U.S. According to the Census, Census Bureau, you have 2.63 people per household, which gives you 16 million black households. 100,000 each to those 16 million black households gives you 1.6 trillion. That would be the numbers for reparation, not the 100. Hundred billion to five hundred billion that some of these people are throwing out. Okay. Um, if you do that, you get the one point six trillion. Okay. How much do we spend annually? One point one point five three, one, one point three billion trillion. Excuse me, is what African Americans spend in the country. So the argument that we can't afford to give this. You know, if, if we're doing better financially, we'll have money that we can put aside and save, which is good for the country, because then we won't be going after social programs that everybody is upset about. We don't need a social pro. We won't need social programs if you just beef up our households. Well, and, and not only that, the America Thrive, and it created a white middle class. You left us out. Guess what will happen if you literally really create a black middle class? You're going to get that money back. It's a consumer-driven economy. Yes. We're going to go buy stuff. We're, we're going, going to go on to vacation or we're going to, you know, buy more. Like, the economy will be humming. Yeah, and 
as far as where the money's going to come from, we just gave out $1.5 trillion in tax cuts. Yes, we did. So to people who didn't need it, didn't even want it. Um, the Wall Street bailout totaled $14 trillion. The Afghan and Iraq war, we spent on the ground $1.7 trillion just building stuff. And again, we've been in war at war for all but 16 years of our existence. Like, the money is there. The money is there. Um, we need to we need to really have um, wholehearted conversations and thoughts about it. And again, if you're not African American, we're not looking at taking anything out of your pocket. And that's the thing that I think, for some reason, it's always a if somebody gets something, that m means that something is taken away from me. And I think that's the mindset that these people need to get out of because even with the tax with the tax breaks, which is contradictory to the whole individual ruggedness, pull yourself up by the bootstrap. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say that and then holler, well, if we give them this, it's going to take from me. No, you pulled yourself up by your bootstrap and you earned it on your own, didn't you? You did. Sure. Well, stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, my top five, um, top five financial news stories and also how to recession-proof your um, household on Financial Renaissance with the M's. Honey, what you cook for dinner tonight? Do you want the good news or the bad news first? The bad news first. I cooked nothing. Well, that's the good news then. Uh-huh. Well, there's no bad news then because tonight we're going to have your palace. Call Jack Palace for authentic Caribbean cuisine, including vegetarian entrees with authentic Caribbean flavor. Call 770-892-5049, located at 6221 Jonesboro Road, Highway 54 in Morrow, Georgia. Jack Palace. For more connected than ever before, 90% of America's students use some form of social media, but not all of it's used in a good way. Hurtful posts online are leading to social isolation for many. Psychologists say it's bullying in a brand new way. Well, Beyond Differences and I Keep Safe are looking to change that with ideas for students, their parents, and even teachers. Take the pledge to be kind online and learn more at wearekindonline.com. We're back with Financial Renaissance with the M's, and we've got Jeffrey right here in the studio with us looking at his phone like all millennials do. They're attached to it, and we're going to go into our top five, new, my top five. Doing research. My top Thank five you. news stories uh, for this week. My top five news stories, number one, was the Federal Reserve saying that they were not going to raise rates again, and a lot of people got excited about it but for myself and I think for Jeffrey it was kind of um, you know we've been tracking the economy very closely since about October of last year there are things that we saw happening in the economy that just kind of caused us to pause and when the Federal Reserve is saying they're not going to raise rates you should be a little panicked too because why wouldn't the, uh, the Fed try to get back the money that they infuse into uh, the economy during the recession as a result a couple of things happened in the markets one one of the main ones was the bond inversion Yep, so um, your short-term rates are actually higher now than your long-term rates. Very simply put, that always signals a recession. Yep. So always. Always. Um, the other thing, um, if, you're, if you're looking at buying a house, mortgage rates are supposed to be in a free fall uh, with no end in sight, they say. That's also an indication that things are not going to go right. Again, if banks can't make money on interest rates, it's, it's not a good sign. And then, of course, the stock market you know, kind of showed its, its emotional turmoil on Friday as well, and the stock market was down. But one thing about the market being down, if we are heading to a recession, um, during my m and money segment, I'm going to be telling you some of the things that, um, that you can do to get yourself ready for the recession. Lonzo Ball. Never lost. Big ball of brand. Let me, <laughs> this isn't funny, but it is a story on why it's important to, to, to know who is touching your money. Um, Lonzo Ball's business partner has, seems to have um, disappeared uh, 1.5 million from his personal and his business accounts. Just lost. Just lost. So Lonzo Ball can't file his taxes, his personal or business taxes, because they can't account for 1.5 million. 
Hashtag numbers don't lie. You have to pay attention to the people that are touching your money. Now, this story is going to become a lot bigger because whoever this guy was, he's a scam artist, and I think he was setting the family up for a, a long time. Um, kind of knew this was coming, but so we'll be following this story as it as it continues to to grow. Or <laughs> so will I get my big ball of brand shoes or not? Nah, dude, not happening. Not happening. I really want to hear. The, the third story that uh, is on my mind this week has to do with Walmart quietly closing six, or excuse me, nine stores in the United States, a super center in Lafayette, Louisiana, and eight neighborhood market stores in Arizona, California, Kansas, South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, and Washington. And Walmart, you know, they came in and they crushed all the mom and pop stores. So now what happens to these communities when Walmart quietly, <laughs> quietly walks away? You know, that's, that's again, Walmart closing stores is another indication of what's happening with our economy. So keep your eyes open. Um, number four is, is one of my favorites because, you know, I was upset with Papa, been upset with Papa John's uh, for a long time. Uh, since conversations about the ACA and Papa John, whatever his name is, John, blah, blah, blah. He's not one of my favorite people in the world. Thought he was a jerk. And so I was happy to see that the company got rid of him. But what's even funnier is that they now want Shaquille O'Neal to be the face of the company. And Shaquille O'Neal, you know, if you don't know, Shaquille O'Neal has his, ma I think he has his doctorate. He mm -hmm. went back to school and Shaquille O'Neal owns a lot of businesses. That funny, jovial, silly guy you see on TV is is a a mogul okay um so shaquille o'neal he understands how to energize consumers and how to energize employees and that's what he's going to be doing but he also put some other demands on the board yes yeah, my understanding i was a little upset when i saw him because i'm like man why would you align yourself with papa jones like who who wants to be you know jump on they the need to call it shit. papa shacks like no just call it shacks just call it shacks like i don't want to say the word papa johns so um my understanding is, is he's made some demands about them getting more minorities, um, I guess, on their at their executive level, um, possibly even with other board members. So, you know, it's he's going to get his money off of it, but he's also trying to open some doors for yeah. other people and force them to do the right thing. So, and Shaq is a big proponent of uh, of uh, franchising, so I'm pretty sure he's going to make it so that there are other Americans that get to take advantage of the franchise opportunities. But again, as long as that place is called Papa John's, I'm not with it. Uh, my number five story it began on Super Bowl Sunday, <laughs> and on Super Bowl Sunday, uh, the makers of Bud Light and and Budweiser, uh, Anheuser Busch, had a commercial, you know, kind of set up in that Game of Thrones or that old school whatever that time period, Renaissance period was, uh, where um, it had to do with corn syrup, uh, corn syrup delivery, and Miller's. Miller Coors, the owner of Miller Lite and Coors Light brand, is suing Anheuser Busch for their funny commercial about uh, corn syrup delivery because they feel that they're misinforming consumers about the contents or ingredients of their beer. Um, did Miller actually come out and say they do not have corn syrup in their beer? You know, I don't. That part I did not look up. Mm -hmm. I was just looking at the lawsuit, so I don't know if they have corn syrup and high fructose, um, whatever that stuff is, in their beer. But the commercial was funny as heck, and I, I don't drink beer like that, Amer or German beers, American beers, whatever it is like that. But I will be. Uh, I'll definitely be looking at, looking into it. Um, stay stay tuned. We're going to be talking about recession proofing your uh, your household on financial renaissance with the M's. Wake up and text. Text and eat. Mm -mm. Text and catch the bus. Text and miss your stop. Wait, 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 wait. Text and be late to work. Sorry, I'm late. Text and work. Text and pretend to work. Text and act surprised when someone calls you out for not working. <clears throat> Me? Text and meet up with a friend you haven't seen in forever. Hi. Oh, hey. Text and complain that they're on their phone the whole time. Ugh. Text and listen to them complain that you're on your phone the whole time. Ugh. Text and whatever. But when you get behind the wheel, give your phone to a passenger. Put it in the glove box. Just don't text and drive. Visit StopTextsStopRex.org. A public service announcement brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. 
long time no see. It's me, the rock t-shirt in the back of your closet. Dude, remember? You crowd surfed in me, man. But you haven't worn me in like forever. I get it, you're retired, but I still got some rock left in me. So take me to Goodwill, where I can really make a difference. Your donations to Goodwill create jobs, training programs, and education assistance for people in your community. To find your nearest donation center, go to goodwill.org. Donate stuff. Create jobs. A message from Goodwill and the Ad Council. Already coaching? Everybody's a coach these days. I get it. Life coach, relationship coach, financial coach. But you want to be a coach with integrity. So get certified and do it the right way. Or add coaching to the work that you already do. Join a cohort or take classes at your own pace. We have knowledgeable instructors. We have a life-changing curriculum. Go to academyofcreativecoaching.com to learn more. Driving has a rhythm all its own. Don't wreck it with a text. Before you get behind the wheel, silence your phone. Or better yet, designate a texter. For more text-free driving tips, visit StopTextStopRex.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. It is Sean Prime from Inside the Loop with myself and Brenna B. And I've been talking about Jeans Body Tech for a minute simply because it's a premier gym in a pristine spot without a premium price. All the weight you need, all the machines you want, free parking... All in Buckhead, come on, it's crazy. 700 Miami Circle is where you want to work out today. And for those who are feeling a little bit down because you may not have followed through on the healthy New Year resolution thing, hey, it's still the new year. You can start today. Look at yourself a year from now, and hello, is that you? Because you're looking good, like snack-like. Yes, you are. 700 Miami Circle, or go to Facebook.com forward slash Jeans Body Tech, also known as JBT Fitness. Either way, 49 bucks is nothing to pay to feel your best every day. And so a new American industry has been born. Sensation Station Network. The warm waters of South Florida may feel great to you, but for your boat, it causes an overgrowth of algae and barnacles. Call the diving specialist at Clean Bottoms to handle all of your underwater boat and yacht needs at 954-278-4514. Or you can check out Clean Bottoms online at cleanbottoms.net. So, this segment of m and Money, we are talking about ways to recession-proof your household. Now, the last time the recession came um, in 2008, it caught us all off guard. And a lot of wealthy people, the top 1%, almost doubled their net worth during the recession. And the reason they were able to do that is they had the resources to buy stuff that was on sale dirt cheap, whether it was stocks, properties, you name it. So one of the things that you want to do, as we know, you know, Jeffrey and I told you that there are signs and symptoms that a recession is coming. Something is coming. So emergency savings. Make sure you have about six months of living expenses set aside and if you're able to save more than that do that because you can use that excess cash for opportunities once the recession does hit second thing you want to do is call your financial advisor or your certified financial planner and if you are within five years of retirement make sure that your investments are aligned for an upcoming recession and so that you can still retire even if there is a recession happening um, you want to make sure that if the economy or if the stock market tanks by about 20% or more, that you have enough time to recover. Okay, some people after the last recession, they can't afford to take another hit <laughs> like we took, like they took the last time. Um, number three is you want to shed any excess money suckers. So that could be children that ask you for money, and it could also be subscriptions. You know, a lot of us have smartphones. We've got tons of subscriptions. Look through all the subscriptions that you have, and any $20 here, $15 here. You know, we were talking about my what I have on my uh, iPhone yesterday. So I'll be going through my iPhone, uh, looking at a lot of the different subscriptions that I have, and anything that's not a necessity, I'm cutting it out. And the fourth thing is to pay down debt. If you're saving money, um, if you're cutting out some of these money suckers, these subscriptions, this excess cash, um, use that money to, one, save. Two, also, is to pay down debt. Make sure that you, you've got available credit in the event of a recession. And then the fifth thing is uh, we're in the 21st century. 
and we all have smartphones with apps and there are so many part-time jobs that you can get as a result of having an app so you've got to figure out before a recession happens how are you going to have another income stream coming in if you are to get laid off you if you are married if you're partnered if you were to lose your income how long can you survive paying your bills without income coming in and so having a part-time job whether it's you know being a driver food delivery package delivery there are people that pick up scooters i know a kid that makes 250 dollars uh, extra on a weekly basis by picking up scooters on the street and he has one of the tiniest cars <laughs> that i've ever seen but he gets about nine scooters in there um, at a time so look at what the things that you need to do to possibly have extra money coming in if there is a recession or if you or your spouse or you are to lose your job you want to make sure that you can survive those are our tips or my tips for on emma knows money What you cook for dinner tonight? Do you want the good news or the bad news first? The bad news first. I cooked nothing. Well, that's the good news then. Uh huh. Well, there's no bad news then because tonight we're gonna have your palace. Jack palace. Call your palace for authentic Caribbean cuisine, including vegetarian entrees with authentic Caribbean flavor. Call 770-892-5049. Located at 6221 Jonesboro Road, Highway 54 in Marrow, Georgia. Jerk Palace. Some knowledge belongs to us and us alone. The way our girlfriends walk, talk, touch their hair. Details that only a sister can know about her girls. But what about our other girls? The ones we carry with us every day. Our bond with our sister girls gives life. But knowing your breasts can save it. Go to knowyourgirls.org for the facts you need on breast health. Brought to you by Susan G. Coleman and the Ad Council. Adopt U.S. Kids presents Multiple Choice Parenting. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you A, put yourself in her shoes? How could he do this to you? And for Sheila, she, she has split ends. B, console her. Oh, sweetie, this is going to happen a lot. Four, maybe five more times before you get married. C, take charge. Got to get this all straightened out. Keep a little talking to, man to man, mano a mano. Hey, Steve. It's now a good time? No? Okay, no problem. Bye. Or D, help her find a new boyfriend. I know a great place to meet boys. The internet. Nice, single boys. Never mind. How about some ice cream? As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on how you can adopt, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A public service announcement from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. One in seven Americans will struggle with addiction during their lifetime. Want to know how you can help? Go to heretolisten.com for tips and tools to help turn addiction around. A public service announcement brought to you by the Ad Council. Radio This feels not great. It's fantastic. Sensation Station Network. You're absolutely right. I step off the train. And we are back with Financial Renaissance with the M. And our special guest, Jeffrey Wright. What a great show we had today, man. This is it's always fun when I get to do this with my partner because... A lot of our, I feel like a lot of our phone, a lot of times I wish our phone conversations could be recorded. They are. Yeah. A lot of times I wish our phone conversations could be recorded because, you know, we, we, we come up with a lot of great stuff, you know, and, and I'm, and I, if I haven't told you, I want to tell you how proud I am of you as a, as a father, um, uh, for being a role model for my son, um, and a great business partner to me. I mean, you and I, um, Man, when I met you, what was it, in 09, 08, 09, you were, like, fresh out of school. Uh, Wasn't that fresh out of school? It was kind of it was fresh. It was, it was close. Um, and just watching you grow and, you know, the person that you've become, and I've always had the utmost respect for you because back when I met you, people used to dog millennials out, and I'd never met anyone with work ethic like you, you know, and I was like, oh, 
you know, you were one of the first millennials um, that changed my mindset on um, on the stereotype that people used to have or has still have. Sorry. Yeah, that hard work is in my bloodlines. It's been beaten into me. Hey, man, isn't your family one of those families that um, you got kind of a special family? You guys have something that a lot of people don't have. Yeah, so um, on the lines of pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, uh, my great-grandfather did. So in 1913 in Alabama, he bought a farm as a black man, which is essentially impossible. It's a family farm. It's a legacy farm. It's actually nationally recognized. Uh, we have been in business 100 years. We now have 280 acres. So when you want to talk about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, we did that. Um, my my great-grandfather, I think, was 16 when he did that in 1913. Oh, he was 16? Yeah. I think, oh, wow. I, I'm, I'm going to have to check with my uncle, who's a family historian, but he was very young when okay. he did that. And um, the, thing that, the thing that I liked <laughs> about it the most was um, great-granddad rolled around with, with the cash. So uh, when my grandfather wanted to buy his farm, the white people in that local community tried to throw at him an insurmountable amount for the down payment, thinking that that was going to stop him from getting it, and great-granddad gave it to him in cash. Yes. So we have a legacy, uh, the, the heir, well, no, I shouldn't call you an heir because I don't know who's getting it, but you are a part of a legacy family, and that, that's just a really, really phenomenal feat. Um, to be in Alabama <laughs> in the 19th century, 20th century, 21st century as a legacy farm family. Um, thank you all so much today for joining us on Financial Renaissance. Uh, we had a great show. Um, love the feedback that we're getting. Uh, coming up, we're gonna, coming up is Smooth Sensational Sunday, and after Smooth Sensational Sundays, we're going to have Connecting the Dots with Lee Watts at four o'clock. Thank you for joining us today. See you next week.